currently is actually a Node developer, just to see some numbers. OK, actually, most of you. Good. So you should have some idea of what's going on. Great. When I started working with Node, I actually came from a Java background. So I wasn't really familiar with JavaScript or Node. But I felt like I could be uh, quite, predict quite productive quite quickly. Like, Node is pretty easy, right? This was the start of a good friendship between me and Node, until Node declared war on me. It was 3 AM in the morning, and I was rudely and abruptly awoken by an Ops Genie alarm. I'm assuming this has happened to many of you before. If it hasn't, don't worry, it will one day. So half asleep, I woke up, and I checked my dashboards. And I saw everything kind of went crazy and then went back to normal again. Strange, but OK. I'll look at it in the morning. This happened several more times, naturally during the most inconvenient moments. So my first, state, my first step towards figuring out how to get some more sleep was to debug uh, and look at my metrics. It wasn't, yeah, so these are the things I saw. All my outgoing requests were spiking with response times. That's weird. None of my dependencies have any issues. Also, I have a two-second timeout on these requests. How is it that this graph shows requests taking up to 10 seconds? What about this graph? Event loop lag, what does that even mean? And are these numbers normal? What about this one? Spikes in active handles, what are those? How do I make them go away? How is it that this problem keeps appearing and disappearing without a trace? Well, it wasn't until I started to try and debug these issues that I realized I was lacking some sort of fundamental knowledge of what's going on under the covers. Knowing the finer details of how Node is working is actually pretty crucial to writing scalable and performant uh, Node applications and making sure you get a good night's sleep. So to understand better what's going on, let's take a look at how does Node handle asynchronous I.O. Then we'll take a look at the infamous event loop. We'll run through some examples to figure out what is Node doing when we run this code. And lastly, hopefully, we'll learn enough to figure out what's going on in my problematic service. So if you're a Node developer, you may have been poked fun at by your Java colleagues for only having a single thread. How is it that Node can get away with only having one thread? Is there really just one thread, or is there some sort of hidden technicality that everyone's leaving out? Well, in contrast to a thread-based approach, where each task is operated on a, a separate thread, Node takes a different approach. You may be familiar with many of the problems that come with thread-based programming. For example, dead logs, live logs, race conditions, just to name a few. Wouldn't it be easier if you only had to worry about your code running on a single thread? Well, Node avoids all these issues by doing exactly that. The code that you write is run on the single thread. So if Node only has one thread, then how is it handling any sort of asynchronous I.O. without blocking this thread? Well, the answer depends on what kind of I.O. we're talking about. If we're talking about network I.O., then Node defers to the kernel using different methods depending on the operating system. Node tells the operating system, hey, I'm interested in changes on this socket or a set of sockets. And it's up to the operating system to manage those connections. Now, the operating system may spin up one or more threads, but that's not really any of Node's business. <coughs> if we're talking about other sorts of I.O., like file I.O. or DNS lookups, then there is a thread pool, a worker pool. But wait, didn't I just say there was only one thread in Node? So this is where a lot of common misunderstandings come, come from around Node. There is, in fact, a worker pool, but it's only used to perform some kind of operations. It's only used to perform different types of I.O. for which there is no or weak kernel support. And it's used to perform some sorts of heavy, CPU-heavy operations like uh, cryptography or compression. It's not being used for the code that you're writing. Most operating systems today, they already provide asynchronous interfaces for many I.O. tasks. And wherever possible, Node uses these interfaces to avoid having to use the thread pool. The thread pool is only really used if there's no other way. The thread pool itself has a default size of four. So it's important to remember that you can block this thread pool fairly, fairly easily. And uh, let's imagine we want to read a whole bunch of files from disk. If these files can be arbitrarily large, then reading a large file is essentially reducing the size of your thread pool by one. 
Now, it is possible to increase the size of the thread pool, but you should be very careful. This can come with some side effects, like increased memory or CPU. So now we've discovered that the code that we're writing is going to be running on a single thread. Then how does Node handle any of our own asynchronous code? And this is where we come to the event loop. This is the thing that lets Node do all of its magic. Let's take a look at the, some examples uh, and see what the event loop is doing. So the first thing that Node does when you run some code is to read your file and execute it line by line until it reaches the end, at which stage it enters the event loop. That's basically it. Run your code, enter the event loop. Now, the loop itself is made up of a number of different phases. And each phase has a specific responsibility. <coughs> the loop loops around between the different phases and then either exits the loop and terminates the pro program or continues looping back to the beginning again. Each phase in the event loop has a queue of callback functions. Now, these functions are these callback functions are functions that you give to Node to be called at a later time. When a specific phase is reached, then some specific operations are done, and then all of the callbacks in that queue are executed. It's really important to keep in mind that these functions are executed on the single thread. So let's take a look at the different phases. Today, we're going to talk about four of them the most important four that actually deal with the user land code. So the first three are, as you see here, timers, poll, and check. The fourth one we're going to talk about is the microtask phase. Now, this phase is run between the other phases. So the ordering is something like timers, microtask, poll, microtask, check, microtask, and back to the beginning to timers. So in order to decide whether we should continue looping round and round or we should exit, Node keeps two counters, active handles and active requests. When both of these counters are zero, then Node exits the loop and the program terminates. Or if one or more of these counters are not zero, then we go back to the beginning of the loop and we continue round and round. Now, active handles are references to open resources. For example, when we create a server and we call server.listen, we're interested in listening on a particular socket, then the counter is increased. Active requests are exactly what they sound like. When we start a request, a TCP or UDP request, we increment the counter. When the request is finished, we decrement it. Let's take now a look at each, fa each phase in detail, and then we're going to dive into some examples and uh, go through the event loop again. So the first phase is a fairly simple phase, the timers phase. Now, the timers phase has a queue of callbacks added by two functions, set timeout and set interval. Here's set timeout. It's useful because sometimes you want to perform a, or execute an action after a specific amount of time. For example, maybe you want to abort a request if it's taking too long. And set interval was similar, but you can execute your function at regular intervals. For example, maybe you want to ping a health check endpoint every second. So whenever you call these functions, you, provi you provide a callback. And this callback, remember, just like the rest, are run on the single thread. So if this is a super slow function, you're going to have a bad time. The next thing to keep in mind is that the time provided to these functions uh, is not guaranteed to be the actual time that, uh, that passes before the function is called. Let's have a look at this example here. We have a timer that's gone off. But currently, we're in the poll phase of, of the event loop, executing a whole bunch of callbacks. It could be quite some time before the poll phase is finished and we continue on through the loop, meaning the timer can be waiting for quite a long time. Therefore, this time provided is really only a minimum time that can pass before the function is called. Similarly, if you pass zero, this doesn't mean your function will be called straight away. It will always be called in the timers phase, which could be some undefined point in the future. Great, let's move on to the second phase of the event loop, the poll phase. And this is where most of the interesting stuff happens around asynchronous I.O. So when the operating system notifies us that uh, some I.O. event has happened, maybe some data has been received or an I.O. request is completed, then our callback is added to the queue to be executed. The poll phase executes all of its callbacks, 
and then it potentially blocks. So blocking sounds like a pretty bad idea. Why would we choose to block in the event loop? Well, we, we block for two reasons. Firstly, if we still have an active handle or an active request, but we decide that there's no other work to be done in the rest of the event loop. There's no point in looping round and round and round if there's no work to do. So we block, and we wait until there's uh, potentially some I.O. come in. For example, if the next phase of the event loop has work to do, we won't block. We'll continue on. Or if the timers phase has timers that have already gone off, we won't block either. We'll continue around looping back to the timers phase. Great. So then the third phase that we're going to talk about is the check phase. And this has a queue of callbacks added by a function called set immediate. This function is helpful because sometimes you want to break up a long running task, maybe it's a CPU intensive task, without starving I.O., so without blocking the event loop. This is the most confusingly named function in Node because it does not execute your function immediately. It only executes your function when the check phase is reached. Let's look at this example. Here we have a, a timer that ends up calling set immediate. It could be that the poll phase has a lot of callbacks waiting in its queue to be executed, which means it could be quite a long time before the check phase is reached and our immediate callback is actually executed. Now, using set immediate is similar to saying set timeout with a zero amount. The difference is the phase in which the function will be executed. And the node docs recommend you always use set immediate for these sorts of cases. So the last phase we're looking at before we we'll get into some examples is the microtask queue. And this is the queue that's run in between the other phases, the phase that's run in between. So this phase actually has two queues, next to queue and promise microtask queue. Let's take a look at the first one. And you may have guessed it executes callbacks added by next tick. So next tick is a really useful tool for developers because sometimes it's necessary to execute a function after the call stack is unwound. Let's, I'll show you what I mean with some examples. Here we have an example of a read-through cache. We pass in a key, and we want to get a value, and we pass in a callback. In some cases, like that's bolded here, we don't have the, the value in our cache, so we need to fetch it from somewhere asynchronously, from a database or something which means we call our callback asynchronously. In other cases, we have the value already. We can just call the callback synchronously. Now, we don't want our function to be asynchronous sometimes and synchronous other times, because that's super confusing, and we could introduce bugs. And this is where we can use next tick. This way, we ensure that our function is always asynchronous. Let's take a look at a second example of using next tick. Here we have uh, an event emitter. And when we create the event emitter, we're going to emit an event. And we're going to attach a, a listener so we listen for that event. What happens if I were to run this code as is? If I were to run this code, the event listener would never be called. Why is that? Well, let's see what happens. The first thing that happens is we create the event emitter, which means we emit the event. And then we attach our listener. We haven't had time to attach the listener before the event is actually emitted. So this is where we can use next tick to solve this problem. This way, we ensure that the rest of the code finishes, the call stack unwinds, and then we emit our event. Right, so that's the next tick queue. Lastly, we have the promise microtask queue. And this is fairly straightforward, because we have a bunch of callbacks added by, you guessed it, promises. And if you aren't aware of promises in JavaScript, they're a way of uh, writing asynchronous code but avoiding the callback hell that you can get into. So anytime you pass a function, a callback, to then or catch or finally, this, these functions will be executed on, by the microtask phase. So once the phase is reached, the first thing that Node does is look at the next queue and execute all of the functions until the queue is empty. Then we go to the promise microtask queue, make sure that queue is empty. Then we go back to the next queue, because maybe there's some new callbacks that have been added in the meantime. We continue around until both queues are empty. So both queues must be empty before we continue. 
meaning you can easily get into a, an infinite loop here if you're not quite careful enough. Great, so now that we know the, the details of the event loop, that's all great and all, but unless we can relate this to some realistic looking code, it's not gonna help us so much. So let's take a look at some examples and we'll see what happens in the event loop and the worker pool when we're running the code. So our first example here is pretty simple. We're gonna create a server and when we receive incoming requests, we're just gonna respond with hello world. So we have a request handler here where we just return hello world. Node executes our code and then the event loop is entered. Now, we haven't added any timers with a set timeout or set interval, so we continue on. No next tick or promises as of yet, we continue. And this is where we decide, should we block or not? Because we have an active handle that we added when we called server.listen, and because the rest of the loop has nothing to do, we just block indefinitely here, and we wait for a potential I.O. to come in. Great, let's send a request to our server. When we send a request, the operating system notifies us we have some incoming I.O. And our callback, our request handler, has added the queue to be executed. So we execute our callback, and we just return hello world to whoever called us. Then we block again, again indefinitely, while we wait maybe some more I.O. to come in. <coughs> Great, well that was a simple example. Let's look at a slightly more complicated one. We're gonna do the same thing as before, but now we have a more interesting request handler. So when we receive a request, we're going to perform an outgoing request to an example API. And that API is going to return us some JSON, which we're just going to pass and return to whoever called us. Because we're distrustful, uh, we want to gracefully degrade, so we'll add a timeout. If the request takes longer than a second, we're just going to abort it. Great, what, what's the difference now? What's going to happen in the event loop? So the event loop is entered. And as before, we haven't added any timers yet. So we continue on, and we reach where we were before. We're blocking the poll phase. Again, let's send, a, let's send a request to our server. Our request handler is added to the queue to be executed. Now we're going to add a timeout of one second. And we're going to ask the operating system to perform the outgoing request to our example API. Then we're going to block again. This time, though, we're only going to block for one second or until our timer goes off. So if everything is working as expected and the API is performing fast, then the operating system will let us know the request has started and our callback is added to the queue to be executed. We're going to add two more callbacks here for when we get some data and when we get the end of the request. And again, we'll block for the remainder of the one second. The operating system will notify us eventually that some data has been received, and our callback will be executed. We'll just pass this, uh, process this data and block again. And then finally, the operating system will notify us the re request is finished, and again, our last callback will be executed. We're going to pass the JSON and return it to whoever called us, and we'll remove our timeout too because now we don't need it. And then we'll go back to blocking indefinitely waiting for some more incoming requests. Right, so now what happens when the API we're calling is not performing fast enough? What happens if it's really slow now? Let's send a request to our APIs before. And as before, we'll add a timeout and we'll ask the operating system to perform the outgoing request. And then we block. This time, one second passes and we still haven't heard back. So the timer has gone off. We'll unblock and we'll continue through the event loop until we get to the last phase. This is where we decide should we exit and terminate the program or should we keep going? Well, we still have an active handle that we added when we called server.listen and we have an active request as well. So we'll loop back to the beginning of, of the loop again. And our timer callback will be executed where we abort the request. After that, we'll loop back to the poll phase and block indefinitely again. Great, so now that we've gone through some examples and we've seen what's happening, let's rewind a little bit back to my problematic service. 
The service in question exposes an API that gives uh, customers data about their purchases at Klarna. Now, when we receive a request, we perform an outgoing request to some other API. And this other API gives us a list of all the purchases that the customer has done at Klarna. What happens in my service when it's running? What's happening in the event loop and in the worker pool? What happens when we receive a request for a customer that has 5,000 transactions, 5,000 purchases? Well, we'll do an outgoing request to some other service, and we'll download some JSON and parse it. Turns out that that JSON can be fairly large. We can see maybe 50 megabytes of JSON. And parsing this is happening in our callback. And as all our callbacks get executed on the single thread, we'll end up blocking our thread. And this will contribute to event loop lag. Right, so that explains why we're seeing spikes in event loop lag. We're stuck waiting in the, in the poll phase while our timers have gone off. And the, poll, the event loop is not able to continue. So that also explains why we were seeing requests taking up to 10 seconds instead of being cut off at our two second timeout. So that's great. Let's fix the problem. What we want to do is make uh, process smaller chunks of JSON so that we yield to the event loop more frequently and we can iterate around. Let's, for example, add a paginated API. So adding a paginated API in this case uh, didn't solve the problem entirely. So our event loop lag went away. Great. But we're still seeing responses uh, take longer than they should. What else could be going wrong? Well, if we're not blocking the event loop anymore, maybe we're blocking the worker pool. So let's revisit the sorts of things that happen there. Well, we're not doing any sort of file I.O. or compression or cryptography. But we are doing outgoing HTTP requests, which means we must be doing some DNS lookups. So let's hypothesize that for some reason the DNS lookups are taking really long time. What would, what would we expect to happen? Well, we have a worker pool with four threads. And when we perform an outgoing request, Node submits a DNS lookup task to the worker pool. If that task is slow for some reason, then we're reducing the size of the pool. And if all the tasks are running slow, then we have a blocked pool. The waiting task queue is going to build up, and we're not able to uh, respond quickly enough. So I added some metrics, and voila, we can see that the time for DNS lookup spiked dramatically whenever this problem was happening. We, this also explains why we have so many active handles. We're receiving incoming requests at a high rate, but we're not able to serve them quickly enough. So how do we fix it? Well, Node has a couple of ways of doing DNS lookups. The first way uh, is the default way lookup. This happens uh, by submitting a task to the worker pool, as I explained. There's another way, resolve, which actually defers to the operating system. And this is not going to block the pool. So it's, it's actually possible to configure which way you want to use. Uh, doing so, you should do with caution, because there are some differences, and you have to consider. But in the end, I learned two very important lessons. Don't block the event loop, and don't block the worker pool. So Node successfully manages to avoid having to deal with common thread-related problems like deadlock, live lock, uh, race conditions. It does so by using a single thread with an event loop and a worker pool to handle blocking I.O. So hopefully, uh, this makes it much easier for developers to write their own asynchronous code. But as we've just seen, it's still extremely important to understand what Node is doing under the covers so that we can avoid these common problems. Hopefully now, you can all understand exactly how on earth your Node apps are working. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>